In the Himalayan foothills, Kathmandu long has been a crossroads. Its streets and holy places filled with travelers en route to a thousand destinations many may never reach. Watched by the gods, some go to market to sell or buy. Some seek to earn a higher form in their next reincarnation. Some climb the steep steps to Nirvana, hoping to escape the tumult of daily life. Sometimes the destinations are only disguised beginnings. For Sir Edmund Hillary, first conqueror of Mount Everest, his greatest journey would only begin at the summit. It would traverse not only the great landforms of Earth, but a less visible geography, the private landscapes of one man's passage through the years. At last, among the long, isolated Sherpas of the Kumbu region south of Everest, it would bring a new challenge, a new adventure, hardly 20 miles from where his journey began. Today, Hillary is a folk hero in the Kumbu. With ceremonial scarves or katas, the Sherpa children honor not the great Sahib who climbs mountains, but the friendly giant who has brought them their first glimpses of a world they never knew. It has been a trade of sorts. In changing their lives, Hillary has changed his own. In the Kumbu highlands of Nepal, each dawn is a discovery. Again, the peaks emerge. Amadablam, Kantega, Tamsirku, Everest. Silent sentinels of Earth's highest mountains, the Himalayas. In the Sherpa villages of Kunde and Kumjung, by ageless habit, yaks and goats are sent to stony pastures, and the juniper smoke from a hundred scattered fires carries morning prayers to the gods. At 13,000 feet, the gods are never far away. Formed 40 million years ago by the collision of the Indian landmass and the Eurasian continent, Nepal is a country set on edge. Here, near Everest, Tibetan Sherpas long ago found sanctuary. Here, for centuries, they lived in rigorous isolation, an island in time. One man has become a major instrument of change, bringing both blessings and danger. With his son, Peter, Sir Edmund Hillary has returned this way many times. But this year holds a special meaning. It is the 30th anniversary of the first conquest of Everest.
I get quite a thrill every time I come back to these two main Sherpa villages. There's so much here that's pleasantly familiar. There's also the thought of soon being reunited with so many old friends. Again they walk the village lanes, welcomed by the greeting of clasped hands and murmured namaste. Already fields are being prepared and planted with grains or potatoes for the short upland growing season. Across a wall bounds an old and irrepressible friend, Pudorje, Hillary's companion on many a climb. Everywhere, young life explores a world made new. It is spring. At last, father and son enter the house that long ago became a second home. Oh, my goodie. Namaste. Very good to see you. Namaste. Namaste. In this house, I can always be sure of a warm welcome and a cup of Tibetan tea. Over the years, my family and I have spent much time here with Mingma Sering and his wife, Angduli, and they are still my closest Sherpa friends. In daily tasks, Angduli endures. Having lost eight of 11 children, she eagerly welcomed the Hillary family as her own. Upon the wall hang snapshots. Fragments of life captured long ago. Hillary's daughters, Belinda and Sarah. His wife, Louise, and the children. Young Peter with protective God. Playful Belinda, the youngest child. Ah, thank you, Aunt Dobby. Yes. We, Tibetan, uh, much lagging. Children say all sweet tea. Sweet tea, yes. Huh? So maybe lagging, maybe not lagging. Ah, lagging. <laughs> now a painter, surviving son Temba remains a victim of iodine deficiency, once common in the Kumbu. Hey, Tembo. Pakadi. Ah, Pakadi. what's that? What's that? Chumaluma? Yeah. Chumaluma. Everest. Pivot on which so many destinies have turned. It was Everest that once joined the widely separated lives of Hillary and Tenzing Norgay, his Sherpa partner on the historic climb. Now, amid the peaks on the trail to Everest, they meet again. Still strong at 69, Tenzing and his daughter Deki have come from Darjeeling to join the anniversary festivities. Tenzing, oh, ah, good to see you. Oh, my goodness. Oh, good oh, hi, Dickie. How are you? Hello. Nice to meet you. Hello. 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 Not only to be honored, but to honor the families of so many Sherpas who have risked and often lost their lives on many an expedition. heroes pause to honor each other, look back to the victory they shared. Remote, seemingly beyond the reach of human effort, the towering mass of Everest at mid-century had defeated all attempts to reach the summit. Then as Nepal opened to foreigners, assaults at last were possible from the south, 
In the British expedition of 1953, guide Tenzing Norgay, already veteran of five failed attempts, would be teamed with Hillary, who earlier had sighted a possible route via the South Col. With the return of the first assault team, the challenge was passed to Hillary and Tenzing. The earlier team had reached a point hardly 300 feet below the summit. Now, exhausted and frozen, there was somber evidence of the tests that lay ahead. But storm intervened. Only after a night racked by winds would Hillary and Tenzing at last climb the icy blade to the summit. There they left in the snow a bar of chocolate and some biscuits. At a lower camp, the main party waited in growing suspense while leader John Hunt scanned the ridges and icefalls above. Then, at last, the returning climbers appeared, led by a teammate, lifting his thumb in a sign of triumph. Briefly, the triumph was shared only with comrades. Then word flashed to the world. This is the BBC Home Service. Here is the news. Mount Everest has been conquered by members of the British expedition. The news reached London in a message to the Times. It said that Mr. E. P. Hillary, a New Zealander, and Tenzing Bhutia, a Sherpa, had reached the summit last Friday, May 29th. The message added, all is well. In London, the coronation of a queen now was marked by a fitting tribute. For a new Queen Elizabeth, an obscure New Zealand beekeeper had set a flag in high thin air, past a boundary never crossed by man. Quickly knighted by the queen, Sir Edmund soon pledged loyalty to another lady, Louise, the young musician who became his wife. Yet domestic bliss soon would be exchanged for the wintry wastes of Antarctica. There, Hillary would lead a caravan of modified farm tractors to the South Pole, setting up supply depots for the first Antarctic crossing. Hero to the world, symbol of high adventure, his life would become a continuing odyssey, seeking new challenges around the globe. Sometimes, with the indomitable Louise on less spectacular expeditions, in New Zealand or the Alaskan wilderness, he discovered the new adventure of watching his children grow. But always Hillary came back to Nepal. Long a forbidden kingdom locked from the world, Nepal had barely 200 miles of road when at last opened to foreigners in 1949. Its few vehicles, machines, and even grand pianos were brought over the southern ridges on the backs of men. Its terraced uplands built by the labor of centuries were joined by a labyrinth of trails on which astonishing burdens were carried by the hardy hill folk or their caravans of yaks. Later, each return of the family would become a journey of discovery particularly for Louise, whose light-hearted accounts of their travels soon became best-selling books. Mm -hmm. 
learning the country by climbing it, the children were taken by their father to see the great peak that had changed his destiny and theirs. For the first time, 12-year-old Peter would glimpse the mountain that one day would draw him like an inescapable challenge. With deepening regard for the warm-hearted Sherpas, the Hillarys eagerly lent a hand wherever needed, opened the door to a culture distant from their own origins. On a mountainside at Tommy, not far from the Tibetan border, they helped build a supporting wall for a Buddhist monastery. Its new leader was a 12-year-old boy, believed to be the reincarnation of a previous head lama, or Rinpoche. When I first went to the Himalayas, my major interest really was in climbing mountains. I got to know the local people, the Sherpas, and enjoyed them very much. And by spending time in the villages, it became impossible for me not to realize that there were so many things lacking. There were so many things that we took for granted in our society that they simply didn't have. And because I was very fond of my Sherpa friends, I had this sort of nagging worry all the time Shouldn't we be trying to do something about the future of the Sherpas and to help them to withstand the changes that were likely to take place? Around Hillary, often watching, were the beautiful Sherpa children, open, quick to laugh, endlessly inventive in play. Yet untaught, their innocence one day could become a prison. In all of the Kumbu, there was not a school to help them grow. He would always remember the words of a village leader. Our children have eyes, but they are blind. And it was then, at that particular occasion, that I decided, well, instead of sort of thinking about it for years and talking about it, maybe I should try and do something about it. Abruptly, Sir Edmund Hillary became a part-time carpenter. Drawing help from contributors in New Zealand and the United States, he formed the Himalayan Trust to support the program. Today, still building after more than two decades, he has completed and staffed no fewer than 22 schools across the Khumbu. Ah, not <laughs> We have a good experienced team to do the job. My brother Rex is a builder by trade back in New Zealand and he's come over here quite a few times to help on these projects. But without Mingma's organisation and authority amongst the Sherpas, I could have done nothing. The patterns of construction have changed little since the building of the first school in 1961. Some children help, some children watch, some children imitate. For some, classes have already begun. always liked about the Sherpas. They always are prepared and know what they can do. They know that they don't have money, but they have the strength of their hands. In days gone by, even my own children, Peter, Sarah and Belinda, used to work in with the local children, carrying rocks and carrying chunks of timber, and I really think they enjoyed it. It's quite exciting to watch a school rise up from its foundations and to see the rock I used to climb being fashioned into schoolhouse walls. A rudimentary structure, unheated, dependent on natural light, the new school at Chondrikaka is a center of village pride. 
Quickly, the people gather, bringing bottles of chong, the local spirits, for the celebration. feel a slight degree of apprehension about get-togethers like these. Any shepherd gathering tends to become a somewhat festive occasion, with the local beer and spirits flowing rather freely, and mostly in my direction. And it's really quite a challenge to survive these functions in an upright position. On behalf of the Himalayan Trust and all those who have helped build this uh, school, I have much pleasure now in uh, declaring the school open. For the first time, the children enter the still empty classroom. Here in this vacancy, each will embark on a new journey of discovery, find new mountains to climb. Today, across the Kumbu, the school bells ring, many the empty oxygen flasks used by Hillary and other climbers. Over the highland ridges, more than a thousand Sherpa children hurry to class each day, some to schools more than a three-hour journey from home. At Kumjung, Hillary remains close to its day-to-day -day activities, still enjoys visiting the first school he ever built, watching children draw pictures of a wider world they have never seen outside a book. Largest of Kumbu schools, with an enrollment of nearly 300, Kumjung has a proud record of outstanding students, some already entering leadership roles in Nepal. It's the soccer team, of course, remains invincible to lowland teams who quickly struggle for breath at 13,000 feet. But schools are only part of a wider effort by Hillary and his associates. Under his direction, three landing strips have been carved on the mountainsides, ending forever the centuries-long isolation of the Sherpas. In the mysterious symbols printed on the cargo, Passing children sometimes try to imagine the wonders of the world from which it came. Built by Hillary, scattered clinics and two hospitals at last provide medical care and have brought a new awareness among the Sherpas that smoky dwellings and lack of sanitation cause many of their chronic maladies. At Kunde, even the local Lama has found a new trust in modern medicine. Ah. 
In a region where formerly half the youth died before 20, there has been a dramatic improvement in the treatment of children's afflictions and a corresponding drop in the mortality rate. For some, the cures seem nearly miraculous. Here, a boy whose hearing has been severely impaired since birth can hear the full wonder of sound for the first time. <laughs> But as Hillary learned during the building of Faflu Hospital in 1975, preparations for errands of mercy are sometimes of little use, eagerly awaiting the arrival of his wife Louise and young Belinda from Kathmandu. He learned that both had been killed in the crash of their plane shortly after takeoff. For Hillary, that day was darkness the beginning of a long journey across a private wasteland without compass or place to rest. really know what else to do apart from go on building the hospital and then later we went back to Kumbu and spent time with Mingma and Angdoli and my various other friends and that was it and they you know had all helped a bit Shaken, Hillary went back to work, building new classrooms, adding to others. That wall's a bit bulgy. Yeah. Well, I think it'd be better to do a proper job with it. Mm -hmm. And you'll have to put uh, other frameworks in, won't you? Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Now at Namche Bazaar with his brother Rex, he studies the damage of time and weather to a school built years ago, draws plans for needed repairs on its structure. I think uh, we're going to lease it soon better than Timberpome Umpura sometime. Still Hillary's trusted Sirdar, or foreman, Ming Matsering jokes over the division of labor in providing the lumber, who will cut and who will carry. Helping, cherry. Are they helping carry? Yes. Is it? Is it okay? Yeah, that's good. Mm. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's a big help. Yeah, then uh, we're cutting, giving, yeah. then they're carrying. Yep. Drawn closer by tragedy, Hillary and Peter each feel a renewed awareness of the risk that lies in every human attachment. Now veteran climbers both, often in personal peril, each has seen close friends and companions lost on mountain walls. Even Peter was nearly sacrificed on the soaring altar of Ama de Blam. Struck by an avalanche high in its icy wall, severely injured and climbing equipment swept away, Peter nearly died in the two days before he finally could be lowered to safety. For Hillary himself, the summits have a new and poignant meaning. He can never again return to those icy heights. Several times in recent years, he has suffered critical attacks of cerebral edema, or altitude sickness. 
Twice in delirium, he has had to be led or carried from the thin upper air to lower altitudes to save his life. Today, the man who first climbed Everest must remain below 14,000 feet. But today, with Peter and Mingma, he will press the barrier, view at a distance the summit on which he stood 30 years ago. For at last, Peter is ready to answer the summons he first felt as a 12-year-old boy, staring in awe at the mountain his father had climbed. Already, Peter has begun preparations for an attempt on Everest by its formidable West Ridge. A geologic accident that became the highest point on Earth, Everest has long been a challenge to Western man. But to the Sherpas, the peaks were something else. Migrating from Tibet several centuries ago, the Sherpas found an endlessly changing world of mist and stone, where peaks and trees and streams appeared and vanished with magical swiftness. Quickly, their imaginations populated the landscape with gods, demons, and spirits of every kind. Even the trees were sometimes believed to be the dwelling place of sacred beings. In a continuing dialogue with the invisible or disguised powers around them, they have given prayer a thousand forms, a thousand means of transmission, written on hand-turned cylinders and water wheels, printed on prayer flags and banners waving in the wind. Inscribed on shrines or chotens. Engraved on stone tablets or manis. Even on rocks and rivers and trailside boulders. Committed to the elements, it is hoped that the prayers will reach their protective gods. The sun diffuses the fading prayer, rain spreads it through the rivers, wind carries it to the heavens. Surrounded by prayer in life, Sherpas are followed by prayer even in death. Into the ear of the dead, the dying, or those soon to die, a monk chants passages from the Tibetan Book of the Dead to guide the consciousness of the deceased in the interval between death and rebirth. Yet prayers must be learned and preserved by the living. At Tami Monastery, its great library of Buddhist scripture must be read and taught each year. Once it was customary for one son in each family to become a monk. But with the growth of tourism, a young monk may well envy the Western clothing and wristwatch of a brother who has become a trekking guide. First encountered as a 12-year-old boy, the head lama again welcomes an old friend. With Peter and Mingma, Hillary has come to help preparations for Mani Rimdu, a yearly Buddhist festival to protect the Kumbu. Oh, nice I'm very well, thank you. Thank you. In the courtyard of the monastery, helped by bare-legged monks, Rex and the rest of the Hillary construction team are swiftly completing improvements on the paved court and adjoining structures. With time growing short, Hillary and Peter also join the crew. Soon the balcony and yard will be crowded with Sherpas and a few tourists who have made the pilgrimage over the steep mountain trails, some from villages many days walk away.
With a sounding of horns, the great cycle of dances begins. As in the religious mystery plays of the Middle Ages, the Sherpas act out their myths, make theater out of faith. Often using the symbols of ancient beliefs in magic, the dances again promise the victory of good over evil. In the Kumbu, every mountain has a spirit. Mani Rindu exorcises the demons that threaten it. Backstage in the Gompa, or temple, another ritual is taking place. Donning the sacred masks and costumes, decorated with an array of mythic symbols, men are becoming gods. For a little while, they will become the holy figures invented by human need. Now, like a challenge, a crash of symbols demands the attention of the threatening adversaries. For it is in the dance of the so-called Eight Furies that the climactic struggle with the evil spirits occurs. In it, the benign gods rise in terrible wrath to defeat and drive away the demons. Once again, the protective gods disappear into the Gompa. Once again, the villages are safe from demons for another year. As always, the people form a line to pass the Rinpoche, bring gifts wrapped in ceremonial katas. One by one they are blessed, take a sip of tu or holy water with a sprinkle on the head, then taste a bit of toma made of flour and butter. The ritual greatly similar to Christian communion with its wine and wafer. Yet watching the Rinpoche bless the people, Hillary remembers another visit when the head lama was a child and the Hillary family helped build a wall. On the western ridge above Kunde, Mingma's wife, Ang Duli, also remembers. In a more private ritual, she brings juniper to the shrine she and other villagers built long ago for Louise and Belinda Hillary.
Yet even the eight Furies cannot protect the Sherpa villagers from the risks of change. Once reached only by an arduous two-week walk over mountain trails, the distance from Kathmandu now can be covered by plane in less than an hour, provided, of course, that the Lukla airstrip, which bears some resemblance to a ski jump, can be found in the frequent overcast. Speaking a dozen languages, tourists from Europe, Asia, and America disembark from the aircraft, pass through the villages, alarming small dogs, awakening the merchants, and delighting the local children who have discovered the blessings of balloons and bubble gum. Today, the Kumbu is invaded yearly by thousands of trekkers and porters plodding the steep trails and spreading their bivouacs across the upper slopes like an occupying army. More ambitious are the expeditions intent on conquest. Since Hillary and Tenzing first reached the summit, nearly 150 men and women have stood on Everest. In Kathmandu, there is a growing list of other teams booking dates on which they too can attempt to climb Everest or a score of other peaks. Everywhere, the sound of the saw is heard. Hillary tells of its impact. I believe the problem of conservation in the Kumbu area is a very serious one indeed. There are literally dozens of small hotels being constructed with a view to supplying accommodation to walkers and trekkers and, and climbers. This has put a very considerable pressure on the local timber resources. In the old days, the Sherpas used to have very strict rules about where they cut firewood, and how much they cut. And the whole society was well balanced ecologically. All that has changed. Uh, nowadays, most of the upper valleys have been completely denuded and many of the forests have been thoroughly thinned out. As the Sherpas are learning, their mountain homeland is astonishingly fragile. Not only in the Kumbu, but throughout Nepal, trees are being cut at a devastating rate one-third the nation's forest in the last decade. Already, ravaged slopes are bringing disastrous penalties. No longer held by trees, landslides are destroying terraces built by centuries of patient labor, have even swept away or buried entire villages. With the help of Hillary's Himalayan Trust, at least one resident is being banished forever from the Kumbu parklands. Relentless foragers of seedlings and low vegetation, goats long have threatened the slow-growing shrubs and trees of the high country. Now Hillary too joins in a great goat roundup with Mingma Norbu, warden of the Sagamata National Park on the flanks of Everest. From the scattered slopes, almost 500 goats at last are gathered near Namche Bazaar and driven to the less vulnerable lowlands in the south. At park headquarters, Warden Mingma Norbu leads an intensifying effort to save the Kumbu from calamity. A student in the first school built at Kumjung over 20 years ago, he is a proud example of the education made possible by Hillary. Now speaking both Nepali and occasional English, 
He teaches a new generation of Sherpa children to recognize the evidence of damaged trees and erosion on the scarred landscape around them. He stresses the critical importance of tree nurseries and the need for a wider program of reforestation, protecting not only their fragile world, but Sherpa culture itself. Celebrated in a museum photograph, the climbing of Everest by Hillary and Tenzing hastened the changes taking place in Nepal. Now on the 30th anniversary of that historic event, the Kumbu is no longer an island lost in time. Yet the past sends emissaries. Announced by the beat of drums, ancient protectors of their Tibetan ancestors appear amid the villagers assembled at Kumjung School. Believed to be the guardians of the four gates of earth, snow lions have come down from the icy summits to dance and cavort for the honored guests. While the conquerors of Everest sample the home-brewed chong of the village women, the school staff prepares a lesson on how mountains really should be climbed. As the guests should know, a little chong steadies the nerves, helps blur the dangers and difficulties that lie ahead. A helping hand is always appreciated. Pace yourself. The steeper the slope, the more rest you need. Try not to trip on a tangled rope. The fall may be farther than you think. When altitude sickness strikes, a whiff of oxygen can work wonders. <laughs> when lost, look for the summit. That's where you're going. Lost that? That's oh, one very big stone. <laughs> In the final assault on the last gale-swept ridge, don't lose heart. You must help to me. Hello, Sanda. You must help to me. Hello, Sanda. I'm ready. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Thank you very much. Celebrating one journey, Hillary begins another. From Kung Jung School, he leads a climb of children.
Bearing seedlings of fir and rhododendron from Sagamata's nurseries, the students of Kumjung School are bringing back growth to the blighted slopes below Everest. Helped by Hillary as they commit roots to soil, they are part of a new children's crusade, not to seek redemption in heaven, but to renew life on earth. Hillary stand the silent witnesses of the journey he began long ago. Amada Blam, Kantega, Tom Serku, Everest. The summit where he and Tenzing once left a bit of chocolate and a few biscuits. Today he has brought a richer gift, the small beginnings of a new woodland the little trees protected by the prayers of children. But the answer to prayers often lies in those who pray. In the opening minds of Kumbu's children lies a measure of their world to come. In them, Sir Edmund Hillary long ago found something more satisfying, more enduring than leaving a footprint on a mountaintop. 